Hello and welcome to Cardcore Gamer. This is a series of videos all about board games. In particular, this is part four in my mini-series about Sid Meier's Civilization the Board Game, designed by Kevin Wilson and produced by Fantasy Flight Games. This time we're going to be looking at the military aspects of Civilization, and these seem to be the ones that have caused people the most trouble. Civilization treats the military in a very abstract way. Warfare is certainly nothing like a war game in this particular board game. Mainly you have three parts to your military. You have figures, units, and combat bonus. So let's take a look at those now. The term figures specifically refers to armies and scouts. Providing you have these available in your pool, you can construct these during the city management phase by taking a city action to build them and paying the relevant production cost. So let's look a little at the army figures, which are represented by these little coloured flags. Simply put, armies show where on the map you are capable of attacking and defending. The only time you can battle without an army is if somebody is attacking a city, as the city's owner gets to defend it without an army figure present. Like scouts, armies initially move two squares without using diagonals and are not capable of stopping on or travelling across water. Another thing that figures have to abide by is the stacking limit. This is the number of figures that may share a space at any one moment. The default stacking limit is two and can be raised through technology. I'll explain the relevance of it later on. Now let's have a look at what armies can do. As mentioned briefly in the resources video, when an army is moved onto a hut, you gain the resource found there. When an army moves onto a village, then the player to your left represents that village, and you must fight them before you can gain the resource. The other thing your armies can do is fairly unsurprising, which is starting a fight. You can start battles with other players by moving your flag onto a square containing one of their flags, or by moving your flag into one of their cities. Before we get into battles, let's look at blockading. You can use an army or a scout to blockade a space belonging to another player. With the armies, this denies them access to that space until you move. And with the scouts, not only that, but it sends that space home to you. In effect, you're blocking that space and or stealing it. This is a good way of putting pressure on a player without actually attacking them. There's one other way you can blockade people, and this one's quite sneaky. At the start of a turn, if somebody wants to found a city, they must do so following these criteria. 1. They can't place it on a water tile. 2. There must be 8 squares around the area where they want to place the city to create the outskirts. In other words, you can't put it next to a map edge. 3. You can't place a city next to any unexplored huts or villages. 4. You can't place a city within three squares of another city, including diagonals, so that the outskirts will overlap. And 5. You can't place a city adjacent to any enemy figures, be they armies or be they scouts. In other words, through clever positioning of armies and scouts, you can stop somebody from founding a city, or at least delay them. This is a good tactic if you want to place a city in the similar area, but you don't want them to get there first. If you can delay them, you'll be able to place your city, and they won't get a chance. Okay, so let's move on to units. Units are the cards you'll be doing battle with when you actually get into a fight. They represent three main types of your army. Infantry, mounted, and artillery. Each card has four different technology levels. You can increase these unsurprisingly through research, and what they do is raise the strength of that type of unit within your army. The problem with this is that as you raise the strength, the cost also goes up. When you produce your units, again in the city management phase by taking a city action, you can only pay the cost for the level of technology of that unit. You'll never be able to produce the cheaper units once you've upgraded. It's important to note that units are not created equal. An infantry unit will have a strength of between 1 and 3. There is a fourth unit that exists apart from the others. This is aircraft. Aircraft can only be gained by researching the flight technology. Now on to combat bonus. This is a number that represents the overall infrastructure of your military. It's easy to understand this number in context of battles, so we'll move on to that now. The first thing to do in battle is calculate your hand size. This is 3, plus 2 for any additional friendly army in your square bearing in mind that you have a stacking limit. You also gain plus one if you're governed by fundamentalism, and plus three if you're defending a city. Once you've worked out your hand size, you shuffle the unit cards you have, and randomly deal out that number of cards. The next step is where your combat bonus comes into play. Your combat bonus is calculated based on the number of barracks, academies, great person generals, and whether you're defending a city. It'll be represented on the relevant tiles as a little plus symbol with a number. Once you and your opponent have calculated your combat bonuses, you compare the numbers. The difference between the two is given to the winning player, who takes the combat bonus card and orients it so that number's at the top, to keep as a reminder for the end of the battle. So let's move on to the battle proper. In Civilization, the attacker is usually given the advantage. This is the case unless you're attacking a walled city, in which case the defender has the advantage. So in a normal battle, the defender has to play a card first. They look through their hand of randomly selected units, choose one, and place it onto the table. 
This is called opening a front. That front can either be attacked by the other player, or they can open up a front of their own. Theoretically, it's possible to continue opening fronts and not actually fight at all during a battle. Once a front is opened, the other player will look through their hand of cards and decide whether they want to attack it or not. You will base this on two things. One, what is the strength of the unit presented to you? This is the number in the corner of the card. And two, what type of unit is it? This is where trumping comes in. Infantry will trump mounted units, mounted units will trump artillery, and artillery will trump infantry. What this means is, if you play a card that will trump the card currently in that front, you get to attack first and deal your damage first. The damage you deal is the number in the corner of the card. Here's an example. So in this situation, the first player, who's the defender, has played a level 1 artillery card to open a front. This is the archer, which has a strength of 2. I look through my hand, and I select a mounted card, the horseman, also with a strength of 2. Being a mounted unit, he can trump the artillery. I play it, deal my damage of 2, the archer takes 2 damage, and is therefore removed from the table. Let's look at a slightly different example. Once again, the defender has opened up a front using an artillery unit but this time it's a level 3 technology artillery unit, a cannon. As you can see, the cannon has a strength of 4. I once again play my level 1 horseman, which deals 2 damage, but all that means is the cannon still has 2 wounds remaining. The cannon then deals its damage back, having survived my trumping attack, and kills me outright with a strength of 4 versus my strength of 2. If we'd attacked with units that don't trump each other, the battle would have gone like this. The defender has opened the front with the artillery tech level 1 strength 2 archer. I play exactly the same card, we both do an equal damage of 2, and both cards are removed from the table. Play continues until both players have played all of their units onto the table, even if one player has more units than the other. Any units which are wounded, you'll place wound tokens on. Once all the units have been played, you remove any wounds from units that survived the battle, and count up the remaining strength values of all the units you have remaining on the table. This is where combat bonus comes in. That number is added to the strength of your units, and can sway the tide of battle one way or another, right at the very end. Whoever has the highest number has won the battle. If it's a tie, the defender wins. Once you've established who's the victor, you need to work out what happens next. Firstly, for every two units the winner has lost, you must remove one army figure from the square that they are in. They can't lose their last figure this way, though. The losing player will lose all of their figures from this square, armies and scouts alike. You also get to keep any of your surviving units to fight another day, and any deceased figures go back to your pool so they can be built anew. Now the victor gets to enjoy the spoils. Assuming they have any of these things, the loser will give you one of the following. You get to choose. You get up to three points off their trade dial, or up to three culture tokens, or a resource token. This does include the huts and villages, but you don't get to look at those before you pick, so choose wisely. Now if the loser was defending a city, this is drastically different. Firstly, the city is removed from the map, and all the buildings, wonders, and great persons in the outskirts go back to the box. Secondly, you get to take spoils of a much greater variety. Assuming you have space, you can learn one of their technologies, or you can take two resources, or you can take one of their culture cards. The technology pyramid and culture cards will be covered in later videos. Finally, if they were defending their capital city, you get the greatest prize of all. You have achieved a military victory, and have thus won the game. Hopefully now you understand a bit more about combat, warfare, and the military aspects of Civ as a whole. Next time I'll be looking at culture and also the economic aspects of the game. As usual, if you have any criticism, or comments, or anything you want to say about the video, just place it in the comment section below, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.